Mike, it's great to have you with us. Uh, it's Mike's second visit. He was here in 2008, just a little bit. Exactly, almost six years uh, to the day uh, when people didn't know if the, what the world was going to look like a day or two later. The financial market had declined. Uh, we're just delighted you're back. Uh, uh, first, for people who you, you heard this amazing introduction of, of Mike, uh, uh, the accomplishments he's had, uh, but what you, you don't know is that, and often is the case behind every person who on the resume and by all external means seems to be a success story. It's it's full of uh, challenges and ups and downs. And in fact, we thought tonight that our theme, and so, so to speak, would be adversity. And what does adversity look like for a leader? And you've had adversity in different spheres of your life, uh, in your personal sphere, yourself, your health, your family, your children, work. It's not all been a linear uh, uh, sailing, uh, sailing boat, has it? Uh, it is fair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dyslexic, so... Uh, all the way back into grade school, uh, my parents were told that I wouldn't probably go to college. Mm -hmm. My dad was teaching at Cornell when I was born, so it probably came a big surprise to him when the first child was not going to attend college. But, Quick uh, question, can everyone hear in the back? No. 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 Dan, if there's a way to uh, crank up the mic a little, thank you. So I think, you know, I started out my career on the basis that I'd better be an engineer because I'd never read. <laughs> <laughs> So my early career was really uh, selling computers for IBM, and then I ran a university for a period of time. And, and the real reason I'm going back that far is to say that the first time I really kind of woke up and realized that, <laughs> and I realized that, uh, that I could actually accomplish something was when I was working at the university as the chief business officer. And uh, I assumed that I was not going to be able to compete academically. In fact, they sent us over to be down. Uh, I was appointed by Warren Dennis, when we made Warren right on years ago. Great leadership figure in the right escalator recently. Yeah. And uh, I was complaining about the fact that the faculty didn't respect me and blah, blah, blah. And the uh, Warren successor said, well, you're as smart as they are. And I said, I have an advanced degree, I can't read. He said, yeah, they're very smart and very narrow field that they're in, but you know, what you're going to talk to them about, you know more about it than they do. And that probably was pretty much the way I kind of woke up to the fact that free work worship God and uh, it helped me kind of define uh, the next few uh, pieces of adversity. Right. Um, and of course, when you were growing up, uh, dyslexia wasn't as, as commonly understood and the uh, they didn't techniques, they, didn't, they just said you couldn't read, not right? Smart. Not very smart. <laughs> Which it's even worse than saying you couldn't read, isn't it? Yeah. So, fast forward, uh, uh, I ended up going to White House as a White House fellow, and then after my White House fellowship here, uh, I went to work at uh, Sanger Harris, which is a federated farm store division in Dallas. And uh, another offer in Cincinnati has a better job, but I decided we want to learn retail from the bottom up. So I said, why don't I start in a warehouse? Uh, nobody will know I'm there, nobody will know I'm at the White House. I really did start, uh, I left the White House on a Wednesday and started the warehouse on Thursday. So I started the White House on the warehouse. <laughs> and, uh, but it was that time after that White House experience that I was feeling, you know, pretty accomplished in the sense of my own, led to my own mind. And uh, the chairman of the, the company at the time uh, kind of gave me the other piece of advice as a mentor that really served me well, which was uh, essentially, you're not as smart as you think you are, uh, because you're not listening to the customer and you're really thinking about yourself. And if you want to be successful in business, you really have to start thinking about the customer and thinking about your colleagues. Did that come out of a certain experience that, that, that happened, or did he just take you aside on his wing, or, or had you done something uh, uh, embarrassing in the warehouse one day? No, it wasn't as embarrassing in the warehouse. I, I just thought that uh, because I had gotten this late start and reason I had to hurry up and do everything all at once. And, you said you're so obsessed with uh, what you're doing, but at the same time, we had four little boys, and my wife suffered some clinical depression, was in the hospital for a couple months. Mm -hmm. He always said, this is what you get when you don't have a balanced life. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, you deserve it. I don't feel sorry for you. You earned it. Uh, so that was a defining moment. Mm -hmm. So how old were you roughly when that happened? Uh, 39. 39. And then we moved to Hong Kong, and uh, with the four little boys, and uh, Worked for a large conglomerate, 
and I'll go through this quickly, but basically we were a very large company, 10% of the total stock market, 15 companies, and I was the, the my college roommate was the chairman. This is Peter, Peter right? Peter right. And uh, Mark Holdings, and John Bannigan, if you remember those days. Um, but it was very tough for me because I was very completely out of my element. I had no idea what I was doing. I asked him why he hired me as the CEO of 15 companies. He said, well, you're the only guy that knew me before I was a billionaire. So, <laughs> I trust you. And uh, somebody asked my wife, Kathy, after we've been there a while, you know, Mike is, is Mike enjoying Hong Kong? So, well, he stopped crying on the way to work the second year. <laughs> <laughs> and she was telling the truth. <laughs> so it was a pretty tough environment. Uh, and what made it so tough? Was it language, culture, or just being over your head? Way over my head, and I had a high expectation of myself, so I wasn't used to failing. And uh, there were 9,000 Chinese uh, people in the company, and just one American. Um, and I was in charge, so uh, they had high expectations. And then I contracted uh, some kind of neurological disease uh, at the end of the second year. And at first, it was Lou Gehrig's disease, was the diagnosis, and then maybe a spinal or brain tumor or maybe MS. And at the same time, we were adopting a little girl from an orphanage who needed heart surgery. So, so let's just pause a second. You just got one big sentence. <laughs> so they thought you had a neurologic Lou Gehrig disease, which is essentially a, a not good, a very short life expectancy, and not a high quality one at that. Then they thought it was MS. In fact, that's when it was all about the same time. It's one of these three things. <laughs> well, pick your choice, right? Or a brain tumor. And uh, your adopted daughter. Right. We, we is this Maddie or? This is Quinn. Quinn. So there's a little three, three-year-old that was in our phase that we were involved with. And uh, we knew that she needed surgery for a heart problem at uh, age three. So we were about to take her back for surgery in Cincinnati where we were where we'd grown up. And but I found out I had this neurological problem at the same time. So uh, I had to tell my college roommate that I can't stay, and uh, he didn't understand that at all. And uh, tried to encourage me to stay anyway, and it turns out that uh, he didn't understand that basically we felt that we prayed about it, and we felt we had to go back. Uh, my wife's an only child, uh, we had adopting a child that had a problem, and my prognosis wasn't very certain. So I would say, from a diversity point of view, it was a pretty good that first time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Let me interrupt there. So you said you, you prayed about it. Is that part of a normal rhythm of what you do, or was that at that stage in your life? Or was Certainly that when you're in diversity, uh, it's a good time to start praying. <laughs> <laughs> um, so go back a little bit. Uh, Has that been part of your upbringing, your faith? I'll just tell you a quick story. So you might have be a White House fellow. It's a kind of a pretty process. I know it's a couple thousand people applying. It gets down to a, Hundred people, then down to uh, thirty-three people, then down to fourteen. People. So um, I applied because somebody in Cincinnati encouraged me as a former business person in the college industry officer that maybe I could be. But without an advanced degree, I figured I wouldn't have much of a shot. So, but I ended up in the national finals, and I went into the room with three day of uh, uh, quizzing. I just really get to the panel. And the first bio on the table was from a current fellow that said undergraduate from Princeton, Yale Advanced Degree, a joint JD MBA from Harvard, <laughs> Lyme since birth, here's a subject of butterflies and free. So <laughs> other than that, other than that, I'm mean, sure you stay here. So that was the first time I prayed. <laughs> so I actually said to, I prayed that there must be a reason I'm here because that's illogical. That I'm here, mm -hmm. and uh, if there's some reason I'm supposed to be here, have me kind of that deal with that. That I'm here for a reason, and therefore I'll do my best. And that's all I can do. And if I'm not selected, there's a reason I'm not selected. So, as it turns out, I was selected, and it turns out nine of the fourteen of us were believers. Yeah. So uh, we just celebrated our thirty-second year an anniversary uh, at our farm a month ago. It's all fourteen of us are still alive. Well. Um, but you know, I think throughout my career, I didn't learn anything from success, to be honest. The things I have learned are usually a point of either conflict or adversity. And I think you have choices. That's a powerful statement that you didn't learn that much from success as well as adversity. I enjoyed success when I had it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I learned anything from it. Was there a sort of a, pick one of the conflicts over the years you could think of that, that 
that you learned from? What did you learn? Well, right after I came back and I started, uh, well, no one started in the longer needs to be, but uh, we were trying to buy Macy's at the time, our company in Hong Kong, had all the cash, and we had made an offer to buy Macy's, uh, which was a uh, failed LDO, and uh, we didn't get it, they didn't accept our offer. But the chairman of the board came over and said, we didn't like your offer, we like you. Uh, would you ever consider coming back to the United States? And I said, well, no, I can't. Uh, I am coming back to the United States, but I'm, I've got a serious health problem. And he said, well, you're going to be in much better shape in New York than you're going to be in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, but I agree may not make it. He said something like, none of us make it ultimately. Why don't we assume you're going to live? <laughs> and so I came as number two at Macy's uh, in 1989. And the reason I'm mentioning that is the university was, I don't think we had a good day of business after I got there. I'm not sure I was going to that. But we literally went to the Because you were a bankruptcy, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> we really didn't have any, uh, any hope of getting out of the situation as much leverage as we had. So we went into bankruptcy, they fired the uh, chairman, and I became chairman of the in bankruptcy. And uh, my MS or whatever it was I was having at the time was getting worse by the day. So things weren't going very well. And uh, it wasn't certain we'd get out of bankruptcy. The judge actually said the creditors wanted that they would help me for a billion aid. Why do we need you kind of thing? And I said, well, you deserve a chance. Right? Give us a chance to get a plan how to get out of bankruptcy. Um, so the reason I'm saying we didn't earn anything from success, we had a lot of adversity. Uh, a team of 20 people that were, were assembled there pretty much all failed together. They had kind of the, the uh, benefit of each other's grieving. It's the same time that we had to get off our rear end and go do something. So we did sell the company uh, for $4.2 billion in 22 months. And uh, 20 people, seven of them became CEOs. So I would say you learn something more in adversity than you do in success. Because obviously that was a lot of adversity. But the uh, part that probably makes us feel the best about it is how much everybody else learned how to process, not just that I got credit for it or something. Matter of fact, at the end of the day, uh, Macy's is a very successful company today. And uh, that, that has to be some sense of accomplishment for that for my team. So. You've used the word team a few times. <coughs> what did you do to try to bring them together? Because it would have been very easy to bail out. To cash out, to do a sinking ship, you know, to get, get off as quick as you can. Well, I, you know, I, to me, I enjoy people. Um, I think that the leader's job is to envision something beyond where you are. You're basically uh, responsibility as a leader is to change things. Hmm. I think management's a lot about getting things to work that you have in front of you, which is a lot about envisioning some a better place for a pretty sufficient reason to get the team to go there. And uh, I think leaders need to be trusted. And there's, I think, a lack of trust in many organizations because people aren't transparent. They don't have what I call generosity, humility, and integrity. Mm -hmm. And those are two things that I think are fundamental to getting followership. Uh, generosity, humility. Well, it's kind of the category of character, right? I kind of, it's a big word, but uh, trust is, comes out of people of character. Because people don't work for them because they are they have integrity, they tell the truth. Mm -hmm. They're generous, they give them the credit when things go well and they take the blame when they don't go well. And they have the humility of recognizing that they're valid. And uh, those are things that I think um, they're practical and I think they're biblically based. And uh, I think people uh, gravitate to people that have a strong character. I also think that transparency is extremely important in leading. When I say about transparency, I, I will use a J.C. Penney example. Um, I retired a lot of moving too far ahead. But basically, transparency is telling the truth every time, obviously. But I think when you're working with people, they want to know where they stand. And most people are reluctant to tell people uh, where they stand. Either they, they don't feel like they should give uh, them bad news, or that they don't seem to be in the good news. Um, but I've always subscribed the idea that the more we communicate, the more likely it is that I'm going to be able to help you or you're going to be able to help us get, get somewhere. And uh, so I believe in extreme transparency. Mm -hmm.
Even yeah. when it's painful. Yeah. And that's frankly, I always convince myself when something's not working, it's not that they fail, it's we fail. Sure. And on the basis of we fail, then how can I help you get in a better assignment? It's not like that you have to necessarily walk away, it's just that you're not well suited, that you're not performing well in the job that you're in, it's not working, you can find something else. Uh, to be more successful at doing something else, you want a different company that can help. You really want to make a change. You know, the, uh, I think in, in so many industry sectors, and even in academia, the, the concept of looking someone in the eye and saying, you're not, you're doing this well, but you're not doing this well, and to help them succeed, most organizations just don't do that. And it makes me think that it, 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 uh, 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 Paul says somewhere in the New Testament about spe speaking the truth in love, that how can you kindly tell someone the truth. And that's a gift, actually, isn't it? Well, I think, first of all, you have to love them. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Telling them that you love them is not the objective. <laughs> uh, I'll tell this quick story because I, I went to J.C. Penney in uh, whatever year it was, 19 or 2005. This is the first time. The first time. Right. I had been retired for three years. We'll skip all the Paris experience, but I, I was working at only major in Paris. I'm uh, pretty uh, in a pretty difficult handicap situation. Unfortunately, I didn't have Lou Gehrig's disease, but I had some kind of undiagnosed neurological something or other. And I had to retire because of being handicapped. I couldn't get around. So, uh, fast forward, uh, I started working with Segway and the Segway board. Started using a Segway. Hey, I can get around. Mm -hmm. uh, so, when I came to JCPenney, Penny, uh, one of the things right away is I noticed that uh, I felt very uh, sheepish about the fact that I had a walk on. And uh, I'll spare you all the details, but uh, so I was not the unanimous pick. Uh, the organization they had inside Canada, they received that person who gave the job. And all of a sudden, that day, they picked me instead. So I show up at the office uh, to be uh, announced. <laughs> and uh, we had a meeting downstairs, 800 people on some topic. Why don't you go downstairs and you, know, you can sit in a meeting and uh, maybe you can introduce yourself. So I go downstairs and uh, there's 800 people in the room and there's six steps from where my chair is to the stage. And it's a two hour meeting, so I have two hours to think about how am I going to get those six steps. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time thinking about that. <laughs> and uh, I think it's a god to uh, It came time for me to stand up and and get up on the stage, and I said, so I stood up and I said, you know, uh, I came here because I know there's a legacy of trust and integrity in Jason Bank that goes back over a hundred years. I just want to test it. I want to put your head down, close your eyes. Don't look up. And I sit there and I feel like, open the trust. <laughs> so, yeah. so I crawl up the steps and crawl across the stage and pull myself up. I said, okay, you can open your eyes, and you all pass. <laughs> and uh, what you didn't see, it's me crawling up the stairs and crawling across the stage and myself. I actually told them what she did. I, I can't walk. So you need to understand, we're going to do this together. we got to do it together because I can't walk. And you know a lot about the company. I don't know anybody. About it, so we're going to do this together. So the reason I say that is the adversity there was, um, you know, trying to understand how am I going to integrate myself after having gone through this being handicapped and staying home and doing the work stuff instead of working. So it's a long way, way of saying that, that uh, I didn't think I spoke very well uh, to these large audiences. So uh, I had a friend that I knew. In fact, there's, there's a story we you know, if you wouldn't mind sharing, where you were invited at one of Howard Butts' big Sea Island events with lots of uh, CEOs and senior executives and their spouses. Uh, Russ and Debbie have been there, uh, and that's where we first met. And, and didn't you, you found out at the last minute you were going to be the keynote. And, but didn't you ask for some guidance nice on your trick. Yeah, nice trick, the bait and switch. Uh, but but did, didn't you get some advice or uh, reaction to your speech, and what was that reaction? Well, I, I don't really like to speak, and I uh, don't think I'm very good at it at the time, but particularly not good at it. And I put it out, and I found out I was going to be on a panel with John Whitehead, and uh, I think the head of J&J. Uh, &J. Oh, Ralph Larson. Ralph Larson, yeah. Okay. We're supposed to be on a panel together. I said, so what's my role? But just on the panel. And two weeks before the thing, you know, John White has the 9 commission, you can't be there. Don't worry, it's you and Russ. <laughs> so I'll get there, and of course, Russ is introducing me. 
In preparation for the speech, I kind of put together some notes and I call a friend and I'm going to talk about it. So let me send you my remarks and see what you think of them. So I send my remarks and this is what you're referring to. He writes back and says, This is the worst speech I've ever seen. And he says, Is that bad for you? I said, No, it's really bad. <laughs> So what's wrong with this? He's just telling about what you've done. I mean, nobody cares what you've done. So he said, Joe. So I put through it again. I sent it over a day later. He says, it's still bad. <laughs> it's better. I said, why is it better? He says, there's a little bit about how you feel. But mostly it's about what you think. And they don't care what you think. They want to know how you feel. <laughs> okay, so I should do it again. I finally got to what he said was acceptable. Uh, but I think what you're referring to is that at the end of the time, that was very good speech. He said, if you tell them how you feel about the fact your kid has a substance problem, you have a daughter who's got a health problem, you've got a handicap problem, that if you don't have it all figured out, if you tell them how you feel, how that feels, that means that you can retire before you really want to at age 55. If you tell them how you feel, I guarantee you 20 or 30 people come up afterwards and say, that I have that issue, or I've had I that feeling. And that's actually what happened. And um, so that was what I want to talk about this much more. Sorry, that, but well, that's how we met. I was there, my wife had just been diagnosed with MS, and I came up, I was one of those 20 people, and, uh, and here we are, all these years later. So, what I was going to say about the speaking thing is that uh, I realized that these 800 person things that Penny is used to having were really uh, scary to me. Because I really felt that I wasn't going to be very tough presenting these things. So I asked a friend who's in the speaking business, uh, the speech coach, I said, Do you mind sitting in the back and listening to me talk and see what you think? So he said, Sure, I'll come. So he stands in the back and whatever I do my thing, and I go on the segue, I go back afterwards. I'm, I feel pretty good about it. So he says, Oh, coach, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding? He said, I wish I was kidding. <laughs> I said, what's the problem? He says, you're trying to impress them that you're the CEO and you're not handicapped and you have all of you, you're perfect. And it's just not what it's about. I said, so what's it about? He said, you're thinking of yourself and how you, how you look at them. Why don't you think about them, right? Love them. So love your audience, do your homework, be yourself. He said, you do those three things, all of a sudden it's all about them, not about you. And if they don't like you, they won't invite you back. If you're being yourself and they don't like you, they'll tell you. But my guess is they they probably like you. So that's really been very helpful to me. Not just in speaking, but if actually if you love the audience, do your homework and be yourself, you can relax and do those things. And uh, so that was very helpful. Well, you're loving the audience here. You're being yourself and you've done your homework. So we're a good homework. <laughs> 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 So let's, let's move into some of the extraordinary things, uh, your own health, uh, your wife uh, having sort of postpartum depression, uh, a child with cerebral palsy, another child with substance abuse, another child with heart surgery, I mean, extraordinary, and yet you're, you're still, uh, still rocking, you're still at it. In fact, you, you, I'd like to hone in now on the, the J.C. Penney chapter of your life, and of course two chapters. Uh, uh, one when you <laughs> written her heart, and at least two. At least two. Uh, it's it's. Uh, there are not many times in the corporate world where someone can uh, step down as the CEO, uh, chairman, CEO, have a, have a successor all lined up, and then get a call uh, some seventeen months later to come back. And would you come back and help? Uh, tell us a little about what went through your mind. The departure. So you, 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 you set the stage. Some of you know that uh, Ron Johnson was your successor. All this is public domain. Uh, you had a very activist uh, uh, Ackerman on your board. Is it wanting this person to be on? The board agrees to do it. Uh, what were some of your early experiences during that transition? Well, I mean, there's certainly been enough said about the, the experience on the CNBC uh, all the time, but uh, I think it was clearly a mistake. Uh, to have Ron as the CEO. He'd never been a CEO. And while well, he'd done a good job at Apple and had done a good job at Target, both were uh, very narrowly defined responsibilities. So, uh, had there not been an activist involved, it probably would have been addressed pretty quickly. But there's such an enthusiasm of the Steve Jobs of retailing and arriving. Because um, he was fated as the, the Wunderkind, the, the right. second coming. So, there was a big rush to, to get him in the job. So the 
which seems to happen when you do great things. I don't think anybody had the ill intentions at the beginning. Um, I think the fact is, it's a strange combination of an activist pushing him and a guy having some ideas that clearly didn't resonate. It had a flywheel effect of extending the life of the, the problem. Mm-hmm. Because had either one of the two things happen in its own right, probably two or three months after he came, it wasn't going to work. <laughs> but the result of being 15 or 16 months into it, uh, the company went from uh, having 150,000 employees to down to 107,000 employees. We lost 43,000 employees. Hmm. Uh, we had three billion dollars of cash when I left. We had zero when we came back. Zero. 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 So don't pay me if you just don't have any money. <laughs> 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 And there's a number of things, I mean, there's 30 or 40 things that were wrong, seriously wrong, including getting rid of some of the brands that were successful, changing the aesthetic to modern and traditional, uh, not really resonating with the customer that was used to chase the bank. In fact, even the founding and chasing out of a big part of your customer. We did business with half of the families in America in 2011. So to have an idea that you're going to do something different, you have to find the other half. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I said we the Tarzan's first bottle of jumbo, don't let go of my number one to get my number two. <laughs> <laughs> so I really didn't spend any time after I left uh, at GCPenney. Did, did he time. bring you as a wise counselor and Dutch uncle to help uh, <coughs> give, give counsel? Or, uh, no, when I left, I left. Yeah. And I felt it was important that uh, things were so bad when I left, they hadn't gotten very, very difficult to get. And I just felt that he deserved a chance to do it his way before it obviously made the decision to go forward. Um, when I came back, uh, I was given a call uh, on April the 4th, 2013. We had a Mercy Ships event I was chairing, uh, George and Laura Bush, that next day. And I was pretty preoccupied with that. By the way, the Mercy Ship, Google it and look it up. It's an extraordinary thing. We won't dwell on tonight, but essentially it's a, it's a floating hospital that goes to some of the most dangerous, poorest places around the world. And Mike has helped build a sort of a massive one. It's the size of three football fields, and they've raised billions of dollars. It's just an extraordinary story. It's, 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 it's on its way, right? Yeah. Uh, but we'll just we'll park that in Google. It's just another great part of your story. But you just come back from the Mercy. So I got a call from the chairman. He said, This is a call I never wanted to have to make. And I said, I'll do it. <laughs> Before he even and I said, how did you know? I said, I can't watch this game. <laughs> this is just unbelievable. And he said, you're not allowed to take, you're not allowed to say yes to a seat that we have no money. Hmm. I said, what well, is it? Somebody has to do this. And I've done no money before. Uh, yeah, so let's address that. Were you motivated by uh, uh, sort of pride or vanity? Uh, that, you know, to no, come back and show, hey, I, you know, I'm the guy. I literally had not spoken to anybody at the company for 15 months. So it wasn't as if I had friends there that I was talking to. It was strength, yeah. Right. I, I just felt like the ones who stayed deserve a better fate. Hmm. Right. So I didn't know that I could do it by myself. I certainly could do it by myself, but I didn't know there was an easy answer. I just felt I had the best shot because mm-hmm. I knew people. Mm-hmm. And um, if it could be saved, the people that were going to save were the people that stayed. Mm-hmm. But not a time to start over. Uh, we had raised a couple of billion dollars from Goldman Sachs uh, mm-hmm. to be able to finance the business, which we did pretty quickly. And uh, while I can't announce our Black Friday results, I we're going to do it quite a while. Mm-hmm. So it took a while. This is month 20. And the, the, there was a lot of pain in the Plano headquarters as well as around the region, I would say. And why was that? Um, most of them, um, a lot of them were trying to look back and try to figure out what they could have done differently that would somehow lead to a different result, which is not really unfair to think of them to worry about because they couldn't control all the very things. Because Ron Johnson, brought, he brought in all his players, his team. Uh, uh, let go 59 officers in the first week. 59 officers the first week. That, that pair was $170 million. Mm-hmm. Those are the people he had. And they replaced with 21 people. You know, they made $20 million. By the way, you're, you're being a bit modest, and one of the things you, you've told me offline is that one of the reasons that you didn't want any money when you came back is out of um, uh, empathy for all those who had been kicked out. No, we were paid for a year and a half. I mean, I'm going to come back. And, I mean, they paid me more than the straight when I left. So. From my perspective, it wasn't about that. 
and uh, if the company is successful, those people will be, will be vindicated. Yeah. Um, so it was very important that the people that stay have a chance to be successful. When you lose 43,000 people, there's a lot of people going to do. And uh, I, was, I was saying to Jim Lane tonight that uh, when I met with Lloyd Rankin from Goldman Sachs, he said, tell me, I didn't make a mistake loaning you $2 million. <laughs> I said, well, if we had two problems we couldn't fix, I'd say you made a mistake. But the good news is we have 30 problems, but they can all be fixed. <laughs> and that's the truth. There's 30 problems, and some of them are very severe. But they were all things we knew how to do, which just took a lot of time. So we had suppliers we had to encourage, we had been paying our bills on time, things like that. Uh, the company did a, a buyback, a, a billion dollar buyback of $37 a share with the United States. That cost us a billion dollars to that for us. So there are lots of things that got, got done that were, in retrospect, quite, uh, quite difficult. Um, so we built a team, giving people confidence in the future, um, being there. Uh, 24 7 wasn't a, a, a time you could kind of call it in. I mean, you basically had to be there and say, let's put this back together again one brick at a time. You made a lot of mistakes because you're not going to be perfect fixing things. Uh, we had about a third of our shares were short, so we have at least a third of people are betting against us. Uh, one of my favorite days in the stock market was the day we traded 95 million shares uh, that day. Apple traded 60 million. And that was a third of our shares. We had share which probably last for 15 minutes, right? We saw it get out of We're trading in volatility. So we've had a lot of adversity around us. And the good news is uh, the customer are back. We had 85 million customers in 2011. We have 85 million active customers now. That's true. Right. And uh, they're not spending as much as I'd like, but they will. <laughs> um, I'll just say one interesting story. The Southwest Airlines is a very, very successful company. It's the number one S&P equity uh, increase in the last 35 years, Southwest Airlines. Most people think about it in terms of the culture of the company, because Herb Keller and uh, Colleen Barrett uh, really created an airline for nothing. And uh, both characters, Colleen's on our board, I'm on the Fed board. And they called me down to the office and said, you know, you inherited this mess, and uh, we just have some very stern advice for you. <laughs> so what is that? Let, let the associates decide the culture of the company. <laughs> they have been paid for three years. They're devastated. Give it to them. So our rules are, can't be immoral, can't be illegal, and you have manager's approval to say no to a customer. We give them those are the three rules, let the associates decide. It's number 10. Can't be illegal. It has to be legal, can't be immoral, and let the, let the can't get it. You had a manager who say no to a customer. That was kind of Southwest credo. And they had those folks for seven years as they started the airline. They didn't have flying rights, they didn't have gates. I said, our people were just so feisty, they were angry. They were warriors. <laughs> so, so by the time we got the airplane was off the ground, we had this group of warriors that gave the culture <laughs> for Southwest Airlines. So why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you have warriors? So I said, why wouldn't I have warriors? <laughs> So we went back to the office and I pulled together 16 of the most independent, disrespectful people I could think of. <laughs> <laughs> they were just that. And we put them in a room and said, look, here's the idea. And I told them what the idea was. We've got four hours to design a program for back to school. Like, what do you think our associates, hmm. how they should think about back to school? So they did this program. So it wasn't all high on marketing consultants, it was your associates. I said, the good news is you're not allowed to talk to any senior man. And whatever budget you need, you can so, I'm going to change the budget, it's done. So, it went pretty well for back to school. So, a couple months later, I'm out of Arizona. Uh, normally, I'm running a Segway to get around a store, but I'm walking very well. But I decided the Mesa store, it's a pretty good store. Maybe I won't ride a Segway and just go in like a customer. So, I go public in like a customer. And I look around and quite a bit. People don't look very good. I mean, the guys haven't shaved and it's like the scanners in the store. Are so I see a message on the thing on the lady's bus that says, ask about our guys. So I said, okay, I get it. What's going on? What about your guys? Close survey of big problem in the store. So what's the promise? We haven't had a sales meeting for three years. Our guys just aren't going to shave. 
until we have a salesman that makes it. We're warriors. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I said, you're what? She said, we're warriors. We just have to judge until we have a customer. You're telling customers that? Yeah, I'm sure customers have to judge. She said, I appreciate it. So anyway, that was, that was a self-inflicted um, thing the best store decided to do. So anyway, I decided a couple of years later, I went back on Halloween, the same store, this time on the Segway. They were all in costume. They had made the first sales increase in three years. Wow. The customers were having a party. And it was <laughs> so the warrior spirit, we let we just let everybody do their thing. And they now have uh, 1,100 warrior teams. Our engagement scores went from 57, which is not good. The national average, we're discussing engagement, about 61. Went from 57 to 71 in one year. That was basically the warriors deciding what the culture was like. And our customer experience scores, which are the customer service scores, have never been higher. Last week, Black Friday was the highest customer service scores we've ever gotten in 112 years. So I would say it's entirely because her and Colleen had the courage to tell me, don't try to fix this, let them do it. And uh, so that's been fun. So now the words are out of control. But frankly, the learning to me was the groundswell of desire to win. That their, their motto was fun, fight, win. Fun, fight, win. Fun, fight, win was their motto. They had a plaster all over the building. And uh, I was going to open the store for uh, Thanksgiving with everybody else at 6 o'clock from Macy's from the 6 o'clock, Coles from the 6 o'clock, Target 6 o'clock, Walmart 6 o'clock. So I said, you should go from the 6 o'clock. The Warriors showed up. <laughs> We're not going to have it from 6 o'clock. I said, what time? So we got over to 5 o'clock. It's fun, fun, win. So they decided to party at 5 o'clock. That's from 5 o'clock until 6 o'clock. We had a very good day. And, you know, I just think that. What I learned out of that as an old person is that uh, it doesn't have to all be corporate. Mm -hmm. uh, these people went through a very difficult time. They're the ones that stayed. So they deserve to you know, own the, the victory going forward. And I frankly think we're going to win our space. The other thing I learned out of this is you know, one of the things that very, very successful companies like the Southwest Airlines, Container Store, Starbucks, but they get loyalty beyond reason. They can't, you can't explain why you go to some of the stores. It's so much that you can relate to it so much because it speaks to you. It's loyalty beyond reason. And that's what we're solving for. I mean, in the mid tier retail store, there's no barrier competition. Anybody can put a kind of table out and sell sportswear. So if you want to really own the country, you've got to get loyalty beyond reason. And I think the Warriors program, the opportunity we have to have yeah, the customer really want us to win. That's why I think we have all 85 million customers back in one, in one year. So we now need to give them the butt spend money because frankly we destroyed the number of businesses. We got to rebuild the business where they haven't, uh, haven't had the reason to shop. It's a long way to wait so the word thing worked. And, and throughout all this, connected back a bit of what you're saying with your faith, there's moments of adversity, there's moments of just normalcy, and there's moments of celebration. Do you wear your faith in your sleeve? Does everyone go around viewing you as a sort of Bible thumper kind of person? Do they not even know your personal faith? <laughs> I, I don't think about it. Uh, I taught a leadership class two days a month for six years. Uh, and you taught it yourself yeah. as a CEO? With, a, and with another person. Right. From HR. And the class was a two day class. I thought a little bit. My perception depends when I arrived. I had no prior knowledge of the company, didn't bring anybody with me, but it had been a hundred year old company. But every, up until my predecessor, every chairman of the company had been a store manager. Think about that, for a hundred years. So they so probably looked at you at this. The oldest store manager was the chairman. Okay, so the bench just failed as a, as a model because it, they couldn't leverage the scale of the company and so forth. So uh, I knew that they got a splendid company and a very proud company was depending on a lot of good ideas, the golden rule, get the customer that they deserve, you know, really very, very principled uh, ideas. It was a management-driven company, it wasn't a leadership-driven company. What I mean by that is that the store manager gets paid based on this year's results, this the objectives for their store, 
was very much myopic. So that created a lot of hierarchical thinking. Which being uh, created a lot of desire to hit the number of parts of what it took. So I decided to have a two day class on leadership, which was different than management. And uh, we had 500 people who were supposed to come through this class 30 at a time, and there was a cross section of the company. I only taught four things I already mentioned them earlier. Uh, number one is how you create an inspiring vision with your team, not for your team, but with your team. How do you engender trust? How do you practice candidate transparency? How do you differentiate talent? Differentiating talent means that you have ways to encourage people by their skill improvement as well as rewarding people that do well more than do people that don't do well. They used to have the same average promise for a win company, which made no sense. It was particularly unhelpful to the person not doing well because it, it was giving them the wrong feedback. <laughs> and people that did really well, obviously they weren't getting compensated properly. So I would argue that the leadership class created a different culture of the company and uh, wasn't done quickly, but essentially created a new language for the company. And didn't you have your pastor or pastor friend mm -hmm. to sort of review or vet your, your leadership? He's just saying that as a whole speaker. <laughs> <laughs> he came to a few classes and gave some feedback. Yeah. Um, the funny thing was that the, we asked them to come with a vision statement that they worked on with their team. And they weren't supposed to talk between classes, so everybody had to do their own thing. So uh, the other person and I did through this class, I we pride ourselves in never accepting any of the statements that were good enough. Okay, so we just decided no matter what they put up there, it wasn't going to be good. This is a technique of getting to talk about what is, what is having an inspiring vision. What does it mean for the team to own the vision? So the natural reaction for a store leader is this, is why wouldn't everybody have the same vision statement for a store? Jason Penny stores, they all have the same merchandise, they have the same promotion. So do you really think this personality of your store is the same as the one about No, of course not, they're the same. So we encourage them to come up with what their people can relate to is who they who they consider themselves to be as a family. So some of them are ridiculous. Mm -hmm. They bring in this paragraph that that's why I make them turn around and say, so what does it say? And they could not remember what it says. Okay. <laughs> so if you can't put it on a t-shirt, then it's probably <laughs> So, uh, to be a little bit irreverent, uh, the, the candy buyer, the senior candy buyer came in and... Uh, Never really thought of a senior candy buyer. <laughs> <laughs> That's an image I won't forget for a while. Probably because you haven't thought of that. Senior <laughs> so, her vision of her team was that they, they were going to uh, cover the asses of masses. <laughs> You know, we're going to remember one thing tonight. That's <laughs> yeah. My problem with that is I couldn't accept the thing good enough. <laughs> so it had to be shorter. So we finally settled up. We'll cover your ass. <laughs> but the idea of having some humor in it was to be sure that their team owned this statement, whatever it was. It's like, what we, who we are as a team. Why do we want to be together? Why we're a family? And you know, what's the big lesson? If, if you're the best cook in the mall because you do bake sales with each other, that's okay. If that helps knit together the team to do what they really need to do is obviously take care of the customer. So I learned more than they did. One of the things that always happened at the end of each class is we had a QA or a town hall. And they always say, I can't believe you spent two days down here in this windowless room with us. This is an enormous use of your time. I said, You have no idea. I learned more down here than I think I'm going to do it. Because the first day you don't tell the truth, you're done your best behavior the first day, Mr. Sir, no sir, whatever. The second day you start telling what's really going on. And I'm shocked with some of the stuff that's going on. But I didn't really feel that way. And that is that uh, it changed the, the language of the company in terms of being a little more open about what's going on, what's working, what's not working. One of Ron Johnson's mistakes, quite honestly, I don't want to spend much time on Ron Johnson, is he the first meeting that he met with, with the team that was there, he said, I read really an optimist. I read really don't like to hear problems. I read really don't like people that are pessimistic. So at first I said, what do, you, what do you think you just told them? I said, I just want to know I'm a positive guy. He said, here's what you're, you're never going to ever hear the truth, I can tell you that. And he said, oh, of course they won't. There's nothing wrong. Why would they tell you the truth? There's a problem. You're not going to tell them. So, you know, I'm not picking on Ron, but 
it is the opposite of what the leader has to do, which is obviously be vulnerable and be willing to listen because nobody going to solve a problem if nobody have one. <laughs> and uh, we just hired my successor, African American executive from Home Depot, a terrific uh, executive. And I didn't tell him that story about what Ron said. Um, so the same same venue, he went down to 800 people and, and he stood up and, and introduced himself. And I didn't tell him anything about the previous thing. First thing he says is, I really like problems. <laughs> <laughs> I really like to like to solve problems. So if you think there's something we should be working on, I want to know about it. So I want to be your partner. He's the guy that turned around Home Depot by taking the two-thirds of the people that were in the back of the office and putting the two-thirds of the people in the front with the customers. And he made a very interesting point to me. He said, you realize the big shock I have is I go to one of our stores here now, people are happy coming into the store. Home Depot people, 90% of people are mad. <laughs> something broke. The plumber wants to charge you a bunch for something. They're coming to Home Depot to fix something. I mean, your store is to buy something. It's a very different environment. So I just think that uh, transparency about being vulnerable, being willing to listen, take take the uh, bad news, be willing to be criticized, which is hard. None of us like to be criticized. So let me ask one question and then open it up to uh, questions that you folks may have. <coughs> One of the things I think about that when I look at people in the Wall Street Journal, some of them are friends of ours uh, or, or total strangers, someone who finds himself in an ethical compromise position that somehow they've screwed up. And most of them are terrific folks, but somehow with a slippery slope, pressure, they've gone off the path. They, they've made a mistake in their life and often their family's life is ruined because of one or a series of actions. Uh, how do you, what, what personal disciplines do you have, and maybe your faith plays part of it, maybe not, uh, do you have to say what I would call ethically fresh, to have your character stay fresh and alive and not get dulled by uh, repetition and pressure and stress? I think, you know, it's the leader's job to set the bar as high as the, the organization wants to see it, because they're never going to be higher than the bar you set. Mm. So I had two buyers uh, in window, we have the largest window covering business in the country, I'm sure you all know that. Uh, <laughs> but the two buyers that were very talented uh, decided to take some money from some vendors, some kind of promotional money they should be taken. So somebody came in to me when I first got there and said, these two people did this, I want you to know to take a disciplinary action, put a, something in writing in their file, uh, so they know to stop the way the business. And I said, well, I have a different point of view. So I said, and I said, we take them out in handcuffs. Mm -hmm. Handcuffs? <laughs> they stole. <laughs> they stole something. Okay. Handcuffs. Well, we can't tell other people what they did wrong. I said, why not? Mm -hmm. We've never had a second violation, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the way you said the tone is, um, you just have to be rigorous about appearances. So, you know, vendors at Christmas try to give gifts to the buyers and that kind of stuff. I have a paste tape in front of my door in my office. Nothing crosses that tape. I don't care who it's from, right? Because the point is not that I don't want to take something. The point is, there's no, it's not uh, situational ethics. You know, if it's right, then it's wrong. And we're going to be right because that's who we are. And uh, I'm not saying the ones about it, I just think that's. You can't be wishy washy about it, or the rest of the company will be even more wishy washy. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, things like they want to go to the Olympics, they want to go, but we figure out how to make that work. So, okay, if somebody wants to invite you to go to the Olympics or the Super Bowl, you're, you're welcome to go, but the company's going to pay your airfare. Yes, it, because it's a must be a business idea. Right? Mm -hmm. if, you, if it's not worth us for flying you there because it's a business idea, then you can't take the tickets. Mm -hmm. So I just think you have to take it through. Take it through. Yeah. And you make mistakes. I know. So who's a question or a thought from here? I'll stand up just to catch our yes, please. Yeah. Uh, Johnson was hired for a reason. Uh, he lasted 18 months and was terminated. Are there any of his concepts or ideas still operable? At JC Penn. So to paraphrase, so Ron Johnson was hired for a reason the last 17 months, or any of his ideas still offer, offer, will operate in operation or successful? So this is a little, I've not spoken about Ron Johnson publicly, okay, so, because I don't think that's edifying. 
I'll try to answer your question without personalizing it. I would say nothing that was implemented exists today. Not one thing. Okay? And it's not because they did stupid things necessarily. It's because they didn't do what the customer wanted. So we spent $650 million remodeling the home store in 500 stores. That's a lot of money. Okay. The home stores when remodeled did less business than they did before they were remodeled. Because they were remodeled to a very modern kind of crate and barrel look. And our customers are traditional, mid-tier, diverse, very interesting customer base, right? That's not the way they want to shop. So it wasn't that the idea was a horrible idea, it just had to be a horrible idea for the customers we had. And so there's 30 of those, by the way. 30. 30 of those ideas are working through. Right. So the board, one of the things the board said when I first came back is let's not lose the good things that happened. So I said, okay, that's fine, we'll try to do that. The second meeting was let's not go back to where we were in 2011. Third meeting, I said, I'll think I'm your guy. Because I can't find the good things that happen. And in 2011, we had three million in cash, we paid a cash dividend, we were number one in customer service at Hammond Nordstrom's, we had a Starbucks on social engagement. We were doing just fine until the activist investor showed up. So I said, I must not be the right guy to do this. No, 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 you're the right guy. <laughs> I said, well, you need to get, stop trying to justify your behavior as a board. I was here too, by the way, right? So I was part of the decision. Let's, let's focus on fixing it. Because if we're going to kind of legislate or you know, go back and <coughs> try to prosecute the past, we're wasting time and a lot of making it harder. Thank you. But it was pretty ugly. Sir, uh, Sir Schrock, a of Cincinnati, Ohio, I used to go shopping at JCPenney's and Kenwood Ball. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I'm 31 and I live in Greenwich Village, not Greenwich, Connecticut. But um, and I still carry stamps in my wallet. How are you going to attract people like me? Well, we don't have a, we don't have a criteria for what. We're welcome to anybody that wants to come in. I think more along the lines of 31 year olds, not so much people who live in Greenwich Village, because that's going to be very hard sell. <laughs> well, <laughs> how do you attract the 31 year olds? Just tell you, we have a private brand called J for R. Okay, it actually does more volume than Calvin Klein, and it's for your customer. Okay, so there's a lot of things in Jason Penney that I'll give you the quick sales pitch. The reason we exist today is because we have an environment that's almost as nice as Macy's. Our people respect it almost as much as Carson respect their people, and we have close prices. <laughs> <laughs> so if you think about that, that's a compelling proposition. Yeah. And the reason we can do the $15 average retail for sportswear when Macy's is 27. We used to run Macy's, so I know it's 27. <laughs> the reason we can do that is we produce all the product ourselves in Asia. And brands are our brands. And they uniquely give us very high gross product margin, and they give the customer great value. There's no middle amount. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we're very comfortable having millennials in the store. We have the biggest team business in the United States. Um, Sephora. Is uniquely inside JC Benny, 500 locations. I bought Sephora when I was at LVMH and built the business. It's the best beauty business in the country. And uh, so I think we have the added attractions. We have the two Disney stores in our store. We have a fast fashion with Mango. We've got Cold Spring with Aldo. We've got Modern Boy. We've got this click. So I think you have to have attractions for all different customers. And the Sephora customer is <laughs> yes, sir. Right. Do you think the activist investors are doing anything for the U.S. economy? Do you think activist investors are doing anything for the U.S. economy? Mm -hmm. I'm going to guess how he might answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's hard to generalize because obviously there are situations where activism is appropriate and probably has a lot of value to all stakeholders. My issue would be that I don't know why one stakeholder can decide the fate of an entire community of interest. Because the other people don't get a vote. Right? So if developers that have leases with us, associates who have their career with us, suppliers who are selling us, all these people, philanthropy we do in the community, all that's at risk when one person comes in and says, I have a better idea, I want this to be turned upside down back or see what works. When it doesn't work, the company gets destroyed. So I have difficulty with that. I can tell you just one piece of information that's not out of school with. Um, 
So I, for years, when I worked in France, when I worked in Hong Kong, um, I got in the habit, since I don't read well, of writing myself a note every Sunday morning at 6 a.m. Okay. And it's basically a third of it's what I did last week, a third of it's what I'm going to do next week, and another third is what I'm thinking about longer term. Just did it for my own purposes. Well, when I started working in France and all the companies were all over the world, I uh, had 50 companies, I decided to share that with the senior management team. I sent them a, a fax every, every Sunday with my thoughts, just kind of like what I'm thinking. And that gave them a chance to disagree with me or whatever. So when I came to Penny's, uh, I decided I would send them the board with a email every Sunday morning at 6 o'clock. First of all, people say, why 6 o'clock? Well, my wife's not up. No one's ever asked for a meeting at that time. <laughs> and I'm not awake enough to make this big pain. I'm just go ahead and do it. And it's test typos as the medical errors and so forth. But I typically just this was the last week, this was the next week. And so the reason I'm telling you the story is when the actives joined the board, it didn't occur to me I'm also sending this to the actives. <laughs> I mean, I'm smart enough to realize this on the board, I'm going to send it to them, right? So one of the first things I wrote when my predecessor, my successor, I don't know what you look at, when Ron joined the company, he said, first week I wrote my weekly letter, he hasn't asked a question yet. That's concern. Did concern me. Didn't ask any questions. I didn't seem to care what was going on. The second thing I said, most of what he says makes no sense for our customer. The third week, uh, they announced that I was leaving and I was going to be the CEO. So, I just say, you know, there are parts of this that are hard uh, not to understand exactly what happened, but uh, I was there. I, I should have done something differently, probably, to, to stop the, the bleeding, but the actress part of it didn't play out well for anybody. Playing the actress. What do you do to take the temperature of the organization? Bill Marriott, for instance, visits 300 hotels a year. And one thing he always looks at is if the manager has to look at somebody's name tag to know who he is. I'm just wondering if you have something similar like Why don't you get around as well as Bill? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be around. I probably need 50 or 60 stores a year. Um, try to do as many as I can. All of our stores are the same, unlike uh, Marriott, uh, the different properties have different character. We have the same merchandise, same promotion, same standards in every store. That's one of the reasons we can uh, cost structure. But I've got 5,000 people in the office. That's where, that's the audience so we spend the most time with. And the big advantage of having a segue is I'm about a foot and a half taller than most people. <laughs> <laughs> so you get extra credit for being around. I mean, I, I literally, people think I'm around all the time. I'm probably not around any more than anybody else. It's just that they see you swinging around. <laughs> so you get extra credit for being there. And retailing is a very interesting business if you happen to like granularity of people. So there's a zillion numbers and ways to look at things. And it's all about people. And uh, we haven't lost a person since I came back. I say a person in the top of many officers. Obviously, 150,000 people. It's interesting to see just you grow and you say that that really means something. Well, I just think that they decided there's something important that's going to happen here and they want to be part of it. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. One more question from someone. Yes, please. I'm going to violate your, your rule of going to say a statement. For, for a bad speaker, you're a pretty damn good speaker. <laughs> <laughs> So what's going to happen next? Thanks, Mike. Um, my wife and I have been very fortunate uh, in financial success. We're investing a lot in uh, other people's work. So very involved in Chairman Mercy Ships for 15 years. So that's big. Four of our kids have lived on the ship for over six months. That's uh, certainly been a big impression on us and them. Uh, so I think there's philanthropic things we can continue to do. Uh, I'm still on Starbucks board for 13 years, so I'm just just stepping down as the chairman of the Fed next week. So there's still lots of things to do. Uh, I did speak to a group the other day of uh, strategy and communications consultancy. I was a thing like I was the CEO that they were in their meeting. So at the end of time, one of them says, you seem to be a fairly joyful CEO. I didn't seem to be a joyful CEO. <laughs> I said, you're told you have Lou Garrison's in 
1988, and I'm speaking to you now. I'm joyful. Quite <laughs> great. <laughs> so that's the best I can do. That's great. Well, uh, how about we give an amazing round of applause?